Hello Booktube, I'm Sean the Book Maniac. Welcome back to mine and Doris of Aldi Books channels. We have been reading and discussing the uh, Faber 90 series of single bound short stories released this year in commemoration of their 90th anniversary. And this one is Juna Barnes' The Lydia... The Lydia Stepto Stories. This Lydia Stepto was a pen name that Juna Barnes used for some of her earliest published short stories. Three of them have been collected in this volume. Unlike all of the other ones, this volume contains three very short stories. The other ones we've discussed, and I think pretty much the rest of the batch, are one story, one volume. Juna Barnes, I have been hearing about since I came out of the closet in 1986. She's a lesbian slash bisexual writer. She was born in New York State in 1892, and she died in New York City 90 years later one week after her 90th birthday. She was part of the Bohemian crowd, spent part of the 1920s, I think, including when these stories were written and, and were published in Paris, um, but mostly lived in America and started out as a journalist. But her childhood is pretty interesting. Her grandma, Zadel Barnes, was a writer, journalist, and women's suffrage activist. Zadel Barnes was born in 1841 in died in 1917, and we need to look at her picture. Her father um, took a second live-in wife slash girlfriend and had children by both Juna's mother and the new woman. He was a polygamist. So that was the atmosphere in which Juna Barnes grew up, in a poor household with all kinds of shenanigans and alternative lifestyles, which kind of set the... the uh, the scene for her later life. She was a journalist before she became known as a literary writer and before, oh, what's his name? The type of journalism where the journalist puts himself in the story, the famous uh, proponent, practitioner of that, he died 10 or 15 years ago and his body was shot out of a cannon or something. New journalism. Uh, Hunter S. Thompson, that's who I'm thinking about. So long before Hunter S. Thompson and Norman Mailer and all the new journalists, Juna Barnes wrote that those kind of journalistic uh, pieces in the 1920s, including an interview with um, James Joyce, who was her literary idol, apparently, in which she got distracted during the interview and forgot what he, to write down what he said and put her um, blanking out her distraction right into the article she wrote. And another interview where she <laughs> interviewed a successful playwright that I've never heard of, and I bet you haven't either, Doris. I'll give you a dollar if you've heard of Donald Ogden Stewart. But she was interviewing the successful playwright, Donald Ogden Stewart, and at the end of the interview started shouting at him for rolling over and finding himself famous, and then... Um, saying that she wouldn't mind dying in envy of his success or because she thought she was so much better of a writer. I couldn't quite catch the, the nuance, but all that was in the published interview. So yeah, new journalism, hey? So she was a piece of work. Her most famous novel is Nightwood, and it was published in 1936. And I did the page 112 test. I think it was a totally blind exchange of page 112 last year, and I hated it. Um, I've heard really good things about the novel, but that page 112 was one of the worst that I've read. It was just almost unreadable prose. And then uh, uh, much later, I had watched Brian of Bookish's review of Nightwood, in which he said the writing style and the quality of the writing really went up and down, and he could hardly make head nor tail. I don't want to put words in his mouth. I haven't watched his review recently, but he talked about what a difficult read and ultimately an unsatisfying read, if I'm remembering correctly. So I have never really thought too highly of Juno Barnes since all that. However, I am really pleased to say that having read, I think, only the first six pages of the first story, there's three stories in here, and the first one is The Diary of a Dangerous Child, published in... Vanity Fair in 1922. 
it's got so much energy. It's really, really good. It's starting out really good. It's a f in the form of diary entries by a 14-year-old girl. And she is such a naughty girl. And she wants to, to uh, lead a wanton lifestyle. And she wants to maybe lose her virginity to her older sister's boyfriend. And I loved how that chapter s started out. There's kind of a Mae West energy and uh, just a precocious <laughs> vitality to these very brief diary entries that I absolutely love. I'm going to read the opening three paragraphs, mostly consisting of very short sentences. It's a quick read from the October 4th entry. I have succeeded. No one guesses that my mind teems. No one suspects that I have come into my own, as they say. But I have. I came into it this afternoon when the diplomat from Brazil called. My childhood it is but a memory. His name is Don Passos Dilemma. He has great intelligence in one eye. The other is preoccupied with a monocle. He has comfortable spaces between his front teeth and he talks in a soft drawl that makes one want to wear satin dresses. I just love that and I love the humor embedded in it. Dom Pesos Dilemma. And then, I mean, it sounds like, oh my God, she's 14 and she, she slept with her older sister's boyfriend. And then when you get to the end of that dire entry, it's just wonderful and not quite as shocking as that, but wonderful, just wonderful. So I, I stopped reading a page or two after that because I thought I have enough of a reaction to the first story to start the ball rolling on this video. So I really want to hear, Doris, what your reaction is up until the end of the October 7th entry, which ends at the top of page 9. That's where I have read because uh, I am really quite taken with it. What, do you, what did you think? Oh, my goodness. Yes, at the full of the moon, Don Passos de Lema will be expecting me. His evil mind has already pictured me falling into his arms, a melting bit of tender and green youth. Instead, he will have a virago on his hands. How that word makes me shiver. That's only the one other word that affects me so strongly. Vixen. These are my words. Oh, to be a virago at 14. What other woman has accomplished it? No woman. Oh my goodness. I cannot hardly stop reading this to film this video. It is so good. Oh, it is so good. Um, I watched uh, Hardback. Oh my gosh, I looked her up right before I filmed this. I think it's Hardback Reader. I will be sure and link her below, but you tweeted um, her this morning, so I watched her video. She's a brand new booktuber, and I thought she was just delightful. Um, and yeah, she read the first sentence of this, and I was like, oh my gosh, I have to go read that right now. And this book had me at hello. I am telling you, The Diary of a Dangerous Child. That's the title of this first um, short story. Oh, so good. <laughs> so funny oh my goodness what a girl what a girl she is and I'm wondering if this is just one story and they're like connected somehow these journals because I peeked ahead when you said that it was that short so I'm like I don't want it to end and they're all little journals and the second one is the diary of a small boy which has me way curious and then the last one, Madam Grows Older, a journal at the dangerous age. So yeah, I am way curious about this. And look at this cover. I just noticed this morning that this is an optical illusion. Oh uh, yeah, the, the shoe makes the star uh, at the point of each one. I love this, I, I, wow. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to go finish it now. Hey, Doris. Well, I share your enthusiasm. I finished it a couple hours ago. Five stars. Maybe this is my favorite so far. Absolutely love them. The third story I thought a little bit weaker. 
The second story, Diary of a Small Boy, I loved even more than the first one, a Diary of a Dangerous Child, which I, and I loved the first one, but the, the small boy, I loved him so much. I'm going to follow suit and read a little bit of a longer passage because it's just one of the best things I've read in, uh, in weeks. So he's 14 years old, and he's writing in his diary, and he's talking about some of his family members that seem to live with him, or whatever. One of my most popular feelings, for instance, is Cousin Elda. She is a tall, obnoxious woman in her 20s, with great, coarse, blonde braids. She comes from a far country, England, or one of the Rhine towns, I forget which. And there she leaned out of a window a long time watching the swift running water on its way to the sea. Or she said she did. I guess it's true, because she has a water-watching look, and she smiles all funny and interwoven and quiet. She is not the only unnecessary woman around our place. There are my mother's two sisters, Clovine and Cressida. They are insufficient as friends and practically evaporated as relatives. They are little and whispering, and they are always making you nervous by the number of things they put their hands on. I wouldn't mind if they really wanted the things, or if they would only keep hold of them when they have got them. But they never do. They are always dropping them, and they are awfully sure about criminal law and how much punishment men should get. They sit for hours talking of ways to make bad men sorry. Sometimes I see them from afar off, dropping their knitting and working themselves up. Sometime I'm going to think up a brand new crime and see what they suggest. I think my mother is not very partial to them. She always goes by them without stopping, even when she is talking to them. And if she has much to say, she goes by three or four times. Well, that's a little long, but I just loved that passage and I love the story. I don't think the characters are linked in any way. Did you get a feel for that? The, thematically, there is a sense of violence at the end of each story related to passion or romance, but uh, I just thought this was a gem, and I want to read more by her. I still don't think I have the courage to try her Nightwood, uh, but I might want to try it on the basis of how powerful these quirky little stories were. What did you think, Doris? Well, Sean... I absolutely love this. I thought it was so witty. <laughs> and, and that part you read with um, Cressida and what was the other other one she reminded me of a bovine. Clovine. <laughs> when, you, when she said that they were um, insufficient as friends and practically evaporated as relatives. I mean... <laughs> This is so good. Um, and yes, the the third part was a little bit not as good as the other two, but really, no, it was so good. Um, but I totally read this as um, one story open to interpretation. Yeah, but I actually read The um, Dangerous Child and the Small Boy and the um madam grows older as being the same person it totally reminded me of ally smith's how to be both i just um was looking this up on goodreads uh to refresh myself about it a little bit and saw that you didn't love it but that's okay this is my favorite ally smith thus far i've only read three but i freaking adored this with um francesco who was the um, Italian Renaissance painter that was um, born a woman. And then George in the 60s, the teenage girl that um, has the boy's name. And just uh, how she plays with gender in this book. Totally. I just totally felt that with this one, reading them as one um continuous diary so yeah i'm gonna have a really hard time now deciding which is my favorite because i have three that i really love i think when we get to the end we'll have to we'll have to decide 
which are our favorites. It'll be so cool, but we still have halfway, 10 to 11 to go. So God, this is so much fun. Better than going to the movies with you, Sean. Although that would be great too, except you're in Japan and I'm here. But anyway, yeah, great book. I had so much fun reading it. On to the next one.